The sands of time are sinking The dawn of heaven breaks The summer morn I've sighed for Fair sweet the morn awakes Dark dark hath been the midnight but day spring is at hand and glory glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land O Christ he is the fountain the deep deep well of love the streams of earth I've tasted More deep I'll drink above There to an ocean's fullness His mercy doth expand And glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land And my beloved's mine Yes, he brings a poor vile sinner Into his house of wine Yes, he does A friend upon his merit I know no other stand Not in in Emmanuel's land I stand upon his merit I know no other stand Not even where glory dwelleth In Emmanuel's land In Emmanuel's in Emmanuel's land. Amen. Speaker this afternoon is Shalu Nainan. He's an evangelist uh, from India, and he teaches and preaches the word all over India and abroad. Uh, he is a Bible school teacher, and he's studied theology at a, a particular area in West Bengal, India, as your bio says. Uh, and a board member of many Christian organizations. We're delighted to have Shalu with us as well, and we'll turn the platform over to him at this point. Praise the Lord. I said praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Good afternoon to every one of you. I'm really excited. And uh, I know that you have not taken your plane back to 
US. You are still in India. You started flying with Abraham Thomas, and I'm sure you were there around. You stayed on with Brother Steve Resk, going into different parts, and also with those sisters and brothers who were there serving the Lord. Now we are going to stay there. Right? Yes. You all agree with me? Yes. Thank you very much. We all stay there and see how the Lord is still working in that part of our world. Our God is good. Amen. And He's good all the time. Amen. And uh, I rejoice for the fact that He has given me this blessed opportunity. Never before, I don't know after this, but at least this time. And this was the right time. I think so. Uh, I, I told someone, had this happened 10 years before, we could have done something more. But God, in his providence, has done something at the right time. And I'm glad that the Lord has brought me to have fellowship with you all and enjoy that warmth of fellowship. And it was nice knowing you, some of you here, meeting some uh, old friends, and I'm excited about it. Well, you were looking to India in general, concentrating on the southern part of India and also partly the ministry of MS and SBS, Suvise Shagan Balasangam. I would focus more on to the North Indian situation. Uh, there would be some repetitions in the slides, but I just would go over it as fast as I could. And I want you to please follow closely. There is a small handout, printed handout in your uh, package. If you can just take that out and follow me, it would be much uh, more uh, uh, closer to your heart and you will probably able to understand what exactly I'm trying to pass on to you this afternoon. I want you to watch this slide. Focus on India, CMML conference. India, a land of over a billion people, diverse in customs, cultures and towns, yet so united, deeply religious and God-minded, still searching for peace and hope. River Ganges, where people take holy dips for the forgiveness of sin. India, a land with many cultures, religion, with many languages, tribes, and colors, yet united, yet with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ moving ahead where many are being saved. As an introduction, Apostle Thomas came to India. It was in the first century then, but then the gospel moved to North India only in the 18th century. All these 17 long centuries, gospel did not go to the north. But it was only in the 18th century the Protestant missionaries started entering northern India. And it was William Carey as one of the pioneers who landed in Kolkata in 1793. 
he established this college in Sarampur and he translated Bible into many languages. It says that he translated Bible into 44 Indian languages and dialects. He found, he was the founder of Sarampur College. We see about the Brethren Movement, as you already heard, the World Brethren Movement has a history of 182 years. The Kerala Brethren has over 100 years, but Bihar and Bengal, the present Jamtara has a legacy of more than 140 years of assembly activities. Anthony Norris Groves was a pioneer to bring the Brethren movement to India. And then we read of William Bear and Bowden who volunteered to come to India. They started the ministry in Godavari in Andhra Pradesh, which today is known as Godavari Delta Mission with Arthur Cotton, who is also known as Bishop Cotton. Now, he was the chief engineer who was with the British government. He has played a great role. So you can see how with your profession, you can do the work of the Lord. No matter who you are, you can be involved in the ministry. And Arthur Cotton, he was an engineer. He had the, he had the work of taking water to various drought-affected areas of Andhra Pradesh, the co coastal Andhra, and wherever the canal, whichever villages through which the canal flows today, we have an assembly. Though they are known as uh, the GDMs today, they are known as Godavari Delta Mission, but he was a great man behind that work. And uh, we then come to the north, where we see of uh, uh, Edward Cornelius, who came from Sweden, who served the Lord in Jantara for 50 years, and died in 1916 at Jantra. That is his grave where uh, his mortal remains are, and he will be rewarded that great day. This is the first assembly hall, the thatched building you see, with uh, half-dressed people, half-naked people, with the missionaries there. This was the first assembly hall in 1865. And then in 1868, this was another uh, building, again, but... Uh, Barely used today because it's not uh, useful today. It was in 1868. We see here J. Johnston, who was a missionary to that land, preaching in an open-air meeting. We, read, uh, we see the graveyard of W.S. Bonney, who was in Jamtara for two years, served the Lord there. He died of pneumonia, and his wife was married to Edward Cornelius later on, who was serving the Lord in Jamtara. The growth of the Brethren Movement, how did this grow? The Brethren Ministry started growing much after the independence that our country received in the year 1947. And ever since then, the Indian Brethren, they started moving out to the north. Most of them moved out in search of job. And that was one of the main reasons how assembly started getting established in different parts of northern India. Most of them were uh, from South Indian states like Tamil Nadu or Kerala or Andhra Pradesh. But most of them, they left Kerala. They were from the state of Kerala who came to North India. Hindustan Bible Institute was an institute and a college which was started by a brethren man. He was a Brahmin convert, Dr. Paul V. Gupta. And I had the privilege of studying in that seminary. And uh, he had a vision of sending young men and women trained to serve the Lord in the northern parts of our states. And he did that work, and he had a tremendous ministry. He was from the Brethren Assembly, but later on he had to leave because of some problems. But then that was a base where many of our North Indian pioneers were trained to come to the North India. There are pictures of some of these evangelists. The first picture is of uh, Brother K. M. Mathai, who is still in uh, Bhopal, in central India, he's one of the pioneers. The second is Dr. M. A. Thomas. He is no more, he's gone to be with the Lord. And he is my spiritual father. I came to know the Lord in one of his meetings way back in 1971. He is another pioneer. Uh, you remember Thomas Abraham speaking of three young men trying to walk down from south to north since they had no money. He is one of them. He is uh, Philip Abraham who is now back from north. He settled down in the south. And uh, he is one of the great men of God who, had, who was behind establishing many assemblies. Many assemblies were established by the migrants who came out of their hometown in search of a job. And this happened in late 50s when people started leaving their comfortable zones. 
and uh, people like my parents who left Kerala came to these places in search of job. But then that was a blessing in disguise where they were able to start assembly ministries and where we were born in that land. So in the initial days, most of these assemblies were dominated by the Kerala brethren and the locals benefited very little due to the difference in language. They would not know what they were trying to speak. Uh, if uh, the Indian brethren would understand this when I'm going to say, when they used to say Isa Masi, they would think that they are speaking about Usha machine. <laughs> you know, it's a sewing machine of the Usha company. Usha is the company name and the machine is the sewing machine. So they would say Isa Masi for Jesus Christ and they would think these are the guys who have come to sell Usha machines. <laughs> so this problem of uh, miscommunication, there was a big communication gap because of the language problem. But in the 1980s, we see that the pattern changed. These children of the migrants started getting involved in the ministry. When I am standing here, I am one of the examples of that. We started using the local language. When I say the, lo when I say the local language, I mean Hindi. That's our national language. We started speaking Hindi and we wanted worship services and meetings in Hindi. And when we started using Hindi, that's when people started knowing, getting to know, wow, Christians are not from South, but there are North Indian Christians. Are you able to understand? You know, you need to speak their language. You need to know their culture. And that's what happened after 1980s when there was a change in this pattern. Children of these migrants from the South started using more of the local language than the, in the Southern Indian languages. And this was widely welcomed by the ministry. And now here, the work and ministry of the Indian, lang uh, of the Indian evangelists started progressing. Most of the early missionaries, they were involved in uh, preaching the gospel in towns, villages, and marketplaces. We, were, we had the freedom of going anywhere, standing and preaching the gospel. We just go as a team. We would have a van. We would have over two wheelers. We would go as a team, stand in a place where there are people gathering, and just we start singing, and people will crowd in. There would be 300, 400, 500 to listen to the gospel. We would have a public address system, and we preach to them. And this happened till late 90s. We had the freedom. If anyone opposed, we, would, we had the say. You know, we would go and say, if I am there standing in the open air meeting, if any man would oppose, I would go and say, what happened? Why are you trying to oppose? He says, I don't want them to preach. I would say, you don't want to listen? Better you leave. I want to listen to what they say. We had that freedom to say to that man. And he would go. And we would preach the gospel. But then the scene has changed, the scenario has changed. We are not able to do that. You know, this is what is happening. Outreach ministries are now restricted due to the prevalent persecution activities, especially. And that, that video that you saw is the opposition that our people face today in some parts of the northern states. That picture, that small picture that you see where I'm standing behind, these four brothers were behind the bars for a week. You know what was their crime? Their crime was they were distributing tracts. That was the crime. And uh, false charges were alleged against them and they were behind the bars for a week in jail. But then God does tremendous things. When they were in jail, you know, 14 souls came to know the Lord. Hallelujah. When they were in the jail, 14 people came to know the Lord. They were able to conduct Bible studies. They were able to conduct prayer meeting inside. On a Sunday morning, they had a worship service. Tremendous. You know, and that's why the Lord took them there. You know what happened when they were in jail? I happened, I went to the jail authority, the man who is the jail superintendent. And when I went to his office, to my surprise, he was an old friend of mine. And he asked, sir, why are you here? I said, I have my four brothers inside the prison where you are in authority. He said, okay, I will take care of it. And you know, he did well. 
he took care of them very well but for a week god worked inside the prison now persecution is a blessing i don't say that's something that is harming us it is a blessing but then it sometimes uh, uh, takes out our morale we you know we go low down at times but god is good okay then we see uh, another petition which happened just two months back there also the lord worked and uh, the case is dismissed all of a sudden just last week the the authority said we dismissed the case the lord worked now but still the gospel is moving forward people still gather in teams they go to different places they preach the gospel and the work is progressing the print media is another area where we are able to spread the gospel through uh, literature gospel literature service in mumbai gl is started by missionaries way back in 40s it's still functioning they are a publishing house they distribute literatures needed for the evangelist for distribution and we have the audio visual media the living waters which was started by a radio ministry which was started by brother mcgregor from new zealand he is in, he was involved in radio ministry and that ministry still continues and uh, we have a we had a tv ministry known as sadgame now this was a tv ministry which was uh, telecasted through a national channel where over 20 million viewed this program this program is known as sadgame television ministry and uh, i was one of the preachers there and uh, we used to telecast this program where 20 million people watch this program and uh, it's a tremendous ministry that the lord is using through various multimedias educational institutions healthcare facilities homes for the needy where some of the ministries which gain momentum by the end of the 20th century in north india i'll come to that in detail major breakthroughs what are the major breakthroughs the participation of the local brethren in the ministry people started participating in uh, the ministry they started coming to know the lord you know that language barrier is broken the next generation has come up they have learned the language and they have started communicating the gospel in their language and you see how they are singing these are some of the tribal believers and uh, they are we are not there in the front it's the local leaders who are standing and leading and so you can understand how the leadership is being passed on to the local leadership the local people they are taking up leadership so local first generation believers have started assuming leadership roles in the ministry in some states more than 80 percent of the assembly leaders are locals isn't it that wonderful the local people taking up leadership whether it's singing whether it is uh ministering the word whether it is encouraging others it's the local people who are doing this task the participation of the local brethren bible translation is another major breakthrough in north india you know the bible translated into one of the tribes uh, that's known as Beel tribe they still use uh, bows and arrows they don't use pistols and guns they still use bows and arrows where brother pt thomas translated parts of the bible into bhil language brother babu thomas from my state he is translated new testament into halbi brother babu thomas brothers are here brother joes who prayed he is the brother of babu thomas and he is doing a tremendous work now the literature that is translated into halbi has been accepted by our state government and that has been now used as a part of curriculum in school praise the lord and this literature uh, includes the stories from the bible and they are translated and given in their language and in all the schools where halbi is taught that local dialect this literature is used as an official course how see how god works and God works in tremendous ways. So Babu Thomas ministry. Brother Matthew Vergis who translated the parts of Bible into Wasai. And another brother Benny Kurian who is translated the Bible or who is in the process of translating parts of the Bible into Gondi language. So these are some of the brethren who are involved in Bible translation or uh, literature. Another Bible translation group is the Project Ezra team where I am also a part of it. We have already translated Rai Study Bible into Hindi. And that was the first ever Hindi study Bible which came out in North India. It was a 12 years effort. GMI has a major role in playing 
Uh, Brother Jacob Martin has helped us a lot in that. So some of you have put your hands into it. And we could publish uh, some uh, 10,000 copies of Rairi Study Bible into Hindi. And it's into the hands of the believers now. And they are people studying God's word. We have translated Rairi's book on doctrines, the major doctrines of Major Doctrines of the Bible written by Charles Ryrie, that has been translated into Hindi, and that is going to the believers so that they may learn God's word. Another achievement, Dr. Babu Verghese, who, is, uh, who was a journalist, but now who is in the ministry, his effort of a great research, his research was the contribution of foreign missionaries, the impact of Bible translators and missionaries on Indian languages, literature, education, printing, publishing, journalism, and culture. This was a doctoral thesis which was submitted to Nagpur University. It was very difficult for them to accept that. They tried to see that he wouldn't be conferred his PhD. They didn't want this title to be published. But then the Lord worked. This was accepted by the faculty there. Now he's awarded a PhD on this. And that says what was the contribution of Christian missionaries in the growth of the country, for the growth of the country. So this was a great achievement or a major breakthrough what we can see in uh, the history of the Brethren movement or even in the major breakthroughs that we realize. Another major breakthrough are the establishment of schools, hospitals, vocational training centers, homes, and de-addiction centers. This is the video of a hospital, and then a school, a home, and uh, the sewing training class which is being held. This is a home run by Brother Elias. This is a school, one of the schools where uh, uh, we teach children. So these are some of the areas where uh, we have uh, entered into in the ministry at large. God's light is shining in the community that way. People have started realizing the importance of such institutions in the community where we are able to take the gospel through these uh, uh, efforts. It's so nice to see children get, getting up in the morning, saying a prayer to the Lord. You know, you ask them, who is the true God? And they all say, shout out, Jesus Christ, you know. 400 children, 100 children in the school, they shout out to say that Jesus Christ is the true God. And so God's light is shining into the community. What are the excitements in the ministry? A lot of excitements. The increase in the number of evangelists in the North Indian states. In the 70s, there are hardly 80 evangelists. And when I am speaking, I am speaking about North India, right? I am not speaking about the whole of India. Now, I'm speaking of the North Indian states. In the 70s, there were hardly 80 assemblies, but today there are more than 500, almost 600 assemblies. And that excites us. Oh, sorry, uh, evangelists, I said, yeah. Number of assemblies, in the 70s, there were 90. Now there are around 600 as uh, assemblies in North India. Number of institutions, I won't say that it was, uh, it was zero, but uh, it would have, there would have been one or two institutions here and there. If they can be considered as institutions like the publishing house, the GLS, or the radio ministry that was happening. Except for some of those, there was nothing. But today, there are 30, 37 institutions who are working with the church to spread the good news of salvation to the people. Then the power of the gospel that converts the sinner to a saint. You know, there are... Ample number of people who are touched by the Lord. Either they were sick or they had some problem. They come to you to pray for and we share the gospel to them. They are not only healed physically. They are touched by the Lord. They accept Jesus as their savior. There are many stories which I can narrate. Uh, one story. One time in a place, a lady came with a swollen face. She had some problem. One evening she came to us. She said she wanted to be healed. Prayed for her, we shared the gospel, she went back home. You know what happens? The next morning she comes back healed. The swollen is gone. And she says, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior and Lord. She accepted Jesus as Savior and Lord. And today she's a great missionary. And she's committed by the assembly. She's, you know what is her duty? She goes around telling about the Lord everywhere, wherever she stays. So that is, that is something that 
the power of the gospel is doing the people who are deep rooted in idol worship animism they come out of the gospel in response to they come out for the lord in response to the gospel their lives are changed the unity and fellowship of the assemblies you know we try to maintain that unity maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace we won't agree in everything but we agree to disagree and continue for the cause of the lord and my dearly beloved that is what is very important in our life we agree to agree we agree to disagree but maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace and work together and in north india that is what is happening we are able to maintain that unity that cordial relationship when something is asked to be done they say yes for the sake of the gospel we unite our hearts and the assemblies come together and we work together in the in different states of north india the evangelistic efforts they uh, the missionaries or the evangelists they take up the challenge to carry out evangelistic efforts in districts with no assembly testimony they go to these pioneer areas and the the brethren ensure that efficient logistics to reach out to these districts are provided with minimum effort with minimum uh, logistic things you know it's, it cannot be surplus but whatever is possible the passion for the propagation of the gospel has not diminished and inspires us to strive for the spread of the gospel in spite of the persecution people are still moving on the locals abram thomas said the youngsters in 20s and 30s they are just coming out knowing the lord they want to witness the lord and they want to serve the lord and they keep going after the training the tent making efforts by the youngsters various professionals you know the young men and women whether they are doctors or engineers or it professionals into whatever they are they come into these fields with great commitment to serve the lord and they do stay with us and they do their part if there is a school they come as volunteers they stay in that school they teach the children for some time they teach the language if they are able to teach any subject they teach the subject it would be for 3 months or 4 months or 6 months and then they go back to their respective places so we have tent making efforts we have volunteers like that coming into our place god's provision the faithfulness of our lord in providing to the needs of his servants god's faithfulness i can be a great i can witness about that how the lord had been providing for the need and the god's work which is done in god's way will never lack god's resources that's what hudson taylor said and we believe that and god is providing the challenges there are 536 districts in north india now you can see that graph the number of districts with uh, red or what out yeah there are no assemblies 55% of the districts a number of districts which has assemblies out of 536 districts in north india 296 districts do not have assemblies who will go hmm <laughs> and a district when i say it would have it would vary from uh, 10000 not 10 i'm sorry half a million to a million population when i say one district half a million to 1 million and there are 296 districts where we have no assemblies can you imagine the population strength who will do that work the total population in north india is 960 million and there are only 36 million christians when i say christians it's the christian world the christendom it's not the believers it's only 3.75 and all the rest they are non christians and it's a big challenge with various caste and cultures the limited support from the commanding assembly the assemblies are not able to provide every or fulfill every need of the evangelists you have your children you want them to study well you want them to go to the best of the colleges in the town hello you want them to go to the best of the colleges in the town you want to give them the best training what about these evangelists who work in these villages and towns who do not have these resources the commanding assemblies would not be able to provide for their need and they are many of them they at times step back because when they think of this you know they don't take the courage of doing that work they say it's better we 
do some other job and feed our family and get involved in the ministry. That is at times which is not possible when you see this large amount of population which is still unevangelized. So my brothers and sisters, there need to be a great financial support to these evangelists. You need to support them. You may ask me how much an evangelist would need. How many dollars you spend for your electronic gadgets every other three months or four months or six months? Every six months you change your gadgets. Every three years you change your car. Every five years you go to a new house. Every ten years you go to a new house. Hundred dollar a month for an evangelist in India. And that will suffice his need to take care of his family. At least the primary needs he can meet. The political influence on the local people which creates an anti-Christian attitude in them. And that is increasing, that is on the increase. The terrorist activities, the insurgents. When I say Naxal, it's a group of people who are against the government. They say India is not yet free. They are the militant part of the Communist Party. Or if I say Maoist, you understand that word? Maoist, M-A-O-I-S-T-S. Yeah, that's the group. And they are insurgents who take up... Uh, Authorities in smaller villages, though till yet they are not a big opposition for us, but then they can be a threat to what we are doing. So that's a big challenge. And the corruption in government offices, which delays the pro process of projects. Now in one of the schools where I am involved in, just now I got a text message saying, praise the Lord, the registration for the land is completed. Just now, I mean it was Yesterday evening of this time, of this morning, that work is done. We had been running around for the last six months to get something done for the land. And they were just withholding, withholding, withholding. But today, that work is completed. Praise the Lord. So that corruption, it's a big challenge. There are many projects that want to be done, but it's not possible. Then people are taken out of the society, the Austria ostracism of first generation Christians they don't they are not allowed to take water from the well they are excommunicated from the community there was an old man who came to know the Lord he was a priest he was a temple priest he came to know the Lord and his own children his own children they disowned him they said we don't want him as our father and you know what did the church do the church brought him to the house, the local evangelist, and he was staying with the local evangelist till his death. So this is what is happening. It's a big challenge. The financial instability, the discouragement, the heart of the people involved in the ministry. And that's why uh, somebody was saying that you make a call, give a call, talk to them. And today communication has become very easy. So what can you do? You pray for specific ministries. Church planting, Media ministries, Bible schools, educational institutions, hospitals, homes. You start praying. And when you start praying, you know what will happen? You will start getting involved. The problem is why we don't involve? We don't want to pray. <laughs> if we don't pray, we cannot get involved. And when we start praying, we start getting involved in the ministries. And that is what you can do. My brothers and sisters, let me share my experience. We have three children. When they were small kids, me and my wife, we used to keep them on our laps. I would place my hand on the head of my children and would pray to the Lord, Lord, no matter how great they are going to become famous in this world, but we as husband and wife, as father and mother, we want our children to be serving you. This had been our prayer over the years. And of late, our second son, who is doing his post-graduation in education, you know, he came to me and said, Daddy, I know one thing. No matter how much I study, I'm going to be used for the Lord, for his glory. How many of you would pray for your son, for your daughter? Lord, send him, her, as a missionary. Send him, her, as a missionary. I want to see my son to be, a, to be in the mission field. Will you be able to pray? 
Let's start praying for these special ministries and start sending people, short-term and long-term volunteers. We heard about them. We have those young, uh, smiling faces who came up and shared their joy of coming as volunteers, building projects into hospitals as nurses and doctors, make computer programs for them, websites for them, come as nurses and work in hospitals, short-term and long-term volunteers. Visit. Either you go or you send. Is that possible? We can do it. We can do it. It's very easy. We need to have a heart. We need to be shaken from our comfort zone. And that's what happened to me. I was born in a good, good well-to-do family. Praise God, I was born into a Christian parents. And all these youngsters I've been inquiring with. You know what? Something beautiful about them. All these came to know the Lord at a very tender age. Be allowed to caught of the Lord early and you will be used for the Lord. Be allowed to be touched by the Lord early and the Lord will use you. So welcome to India. Welcome to our land. You encourage others so that they may have a participation. Extend financial support. I want to tell you something about the TV program that I just showed you. It was being telecasted. 20 million weather viewers. Last month we had to stop it. You know what's the reason? We are running short of funds. We are running short of funds. You ask me how much we need for a one telecast, for one serial half an hour slot, we need hardly 2,000 $2,200, that's all. Just one program a week. Is it a difficult task? I don't think so. It's not a difficult task. Extend financial support, and the Lord will bless you. The past, the present, and the future. And I say like this, the past increases our faith, while the present excites us to fulfill our responsibilities, and the future, it gives us hope. The future gives us hope. With William Carey, I would like to say like this. Attempt great things for God. Expect great things. Attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. Will we be able to do that in our life? In conclusion, come. Together we can rescue these souls from the eternal hell. And uh, before I take part from you from this podium. I want you all to stand and sing along with me this hymn. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. And I'm sure Craig, yeah, thank you. We all will stand together and sing this hymn. And as we sing, may we commit ourselves to the Lord and ask the Lord to help us to do something. Ask the Lord, Lord, how you can use me. Please use me for the furtherance of the gospel in India.
world say